Okay, thanks for coming uh, to the Olympic Pudding. Um, uh, I'm Karina. I'm Lindsay. And uh, we both work on the Continuing Bonds Project at Bradford University. Uh, the project is uh, probably a unique uh, collaboration between archaeology and end of life care. Um, we're an interdisciplinary team um, consisting of uh, myself and Lindsay as archaeologists, uh, but also colleagues from um, uh, palliative nursing, palliative medicine, and psychology. And we've been looking at whether using archaeology can help facilitate conversations around death and dying. Um, we know that death is universal, yet it can still be hugely uh, taboo and hugely problematic to talk about it. So we're looking at whether some archaeological, using archaeological materials can act as a weigh-in for some people. It's quite a safe topic. We can start off by talking about uh, plastered skulls or Egyptian mummies in quite a safe context. And our pilot studies had indicated that um, once people start talking about the topics um, in the safe way, talking about the archaeological material, pretty soon they'd move through um, to talking about what had happened to a great Aunt Mabel. And before we knew it, they'd start talking about their own hopes, experiences and fears in a way that if we'd just tried to initiate a conversation about death and dying, um, we wouldn't have been able to in the same way. Um, we're also looking at whether using the archaeology can challenge perceptions about the right or the correct way to treat the, the dead body. And we're also interested in the collaborative aspects, what happens with this interdisciplinary team um, and what discussions does, does that generate. Um, we're um, trying to build up an evidence base uh, for our hypotheses. Um, and we're doing that through delivering workshops to health and social care professionals and students. Um, and the, the theme of the session here is writing and rewriting the body. And we generally use kind of written and spoken word um, to record people's um, experiences of the workshops and what happens beyond. So we um, evaluate people before they start the workshop. Um, uh, we have a post-workshop questionnaire directly afterwards. And then we um, check up on them a few months later to actually find out whether the workshops have had, had any impact. But in the workshop themselves, we're encouraging dialogue and narrative and stories around the actual archaeological material we, we um, look at. Um, so this involves um, our workshop participants looking at case studies which have been uh, usually prepared by, by Lindsay. Um, in some cases handling some objects, some cases watching videos, and we get them to reflect on um, what the information makes them feel, what they find interesting, anything they want to find out more about. Um, and we record their um, discussions as they go around, but we also um, record their initial feedback points on flip chart papers to capture that initial uh, writings about the various um, topics around dead bodies that we, we present to them. Um, we've also been taking uh, our archaeological case studies out into the wider public, so not just working with invited healthcare specialists, um, because as Karina said, you know, death and mortality is a universal topic and we understand that <coughs> these discussions need to be, be had um, in a, a wider sphere. So uh, we've been pre preparing posters of some of our archaeological case studies and putting them in what you could call non-traditional places, uh, so people who might not necessarily rock up to an exhibition um, on death um, encounter these things um, sort of um, in and about their daily lives. This uh, particular one was put up in Leicester Cathedral during Dying Matters Week in May. Lots of people flocking there to see Richard III, of course, which is having, has his own sort of writing and rewriting narrative. Um, we could talk about that all day, probably. Um, and at the minute, it's currently at Kettering Hospital as well. Uh, we were very keen um, with the focus on generating conversation and discussions, so we didn't want to just present um, our material to the public in a sort of one-sided way, but actually get them to reflect back um, in a sort of co-created exhibition, I suppose. So what we did is we used some of the archaeological materials um, to, um, to, to, to formulate a couple of questions that people should consider while they're going round. So um, this one, for example, what part of you will live on when you die? We've just heard about plastic schools and, and the, the long legacy that they have. 
and circulation out and we, we provided people with post-it notes to, to write their answers which they then stuck up, up there and left for inspiration and thought for others so it was a sort of co-created um, cumulative exhibition really. Um, we're nearly at the end of our workshops, we've just got uh, one more set to go in January and our findings so far have been overwhelmingly positive. I know that the text and the uh, graphics up there are very small, I don't expect you to read them all. Um, but what you can see from the pie charts really are um, asking people whether the workshops made them think about death, and, uh, dying and bereavement in different ways and you can see the blue and the red are overwhelmingly positive answers, the, per uh, the green is not sure yet and uh, the purple is uh, no. So you can see the, the blue and the red sections, uh, you know, taking up most of the pie chart. Um, and the bottom, um, that um, asking people whether <coughs> the workshops increase their confidence in talking about death, dying and bereavement. And again, you can see the, the blue and the red taking up about half and uh, significantly uh, a big green portion there, people who didn't know, which is why the follow-up questionnaires are so important to see if people um, have thought more about it and, and experienced mm. uh, different conversations within that follow-up period. Yeah. Uh, we've got what we're mostly finding out in the green area is that those people were already confident to begin with. Yeah, uh, so it's all relative, that change in confidence is, is quite yeah. a relative thing. Um, we've got lots and lots of findings, but just sort of a couple of highlights, I suppose. Um, using archaeological materials can open up important uh, and useful discussions about death and dying and um, you know I've got a couple of quotes here to illustrate uh, these are this is feedback from some of our workshop participants um, I give talks on the work we do and it's probably made it easier for me to be bolder and braver in talking about bereavement so that was that was one participants feedback uh, two impacting jewels beyond the workshops um, so it's made me think more about my wishes when I die and also think about what, what my children should do after I've gone with regard to mourning period and rituals so really making people, you know, again, Karina talked about moving from the archaeology to personal stories. Um, finally, uh, that it, um, it's important to do the right thing even when you don't know what that is. And of course that opens up a whole uh, box of questions about, you know, our culturally embedded perceptions of what is the right thing to do and how, how we negotiate that and how we mediate that, both, um, both um, as a community but also as individuals. Um, so that the idea of doing the right things to, uh, seems to be all prevailing in the last few days when I care for people's families. They're always asking what's the right thing to do and again we could talk more and more about that. Um, because this session is about writing and rewriting I was quite interested in exploring the language that people use to describe the different burial practices that we um, we present to them and also what my presentation of those burial practices, the, languages are, the language I choose to use to present those burial practices does to those reactions. Uh, we've talked about collecting data in very different ways through pre and post workshop questionnaires and through uh, focus group discussions but um, I'm quite interested in the stuff that people scribble on the flip chart paper as they're going around because this is kind of raw unprocessed uh, reactions, you know, immediate stuff. Sometimes in the focus groups, they've had time to reflect and and be quite objective about it. And but I, you know, I really like the flip chart papers because it's really raw um, uh, and immediate reactions. So, for example, in the last uh, set of workshops, which was on treatment of the dead, I presented two contrasting case studies. One uh, was on mummification, something that, that we've heard already about. Uh, this afternoon and something which people feel already quite familiar with and quite comfortable with. Uh, I presented these two images along with a video from the Smithsonian Museum, a very sort of um, calm female voice explaining the process. And it showed the process of mummification but it was a very calm video, very um, super duper graphics. Um, quite sanitised really and people felt very comfortable with that and mm. um, they used words like oh it looks so expensive, it's time consuming, uh, there's a lot of care gone into this and really interestingly this is a word I've highlighted it because it's a word that comes up and up again in the workshops this idea of respect um, and and people use this word um, quite frequently without really unpicking it very much and I'm quite interested in unpicking what what respect is. Um, in this sense, in this respect um, people seem to think that that it's the, the expense and the time and the care that, that generates that level of respect. So it's about, it's about time and it's about money and it's about resources. I contrasted this with, with a site that I'm currently working on at the minute, which is uh, called the Sculptor's Cave in North East Scotland. And it's a mortuary site, it's a cave site on the Murray Firth. Um, and uh, we believe that it's a primary excarnation site. In later prehistoric Britain, we have very few uh, normative 
visible burial practices and the assumption is that it's exposure burial, next coronation, uh, where bodies are exposed and left to disarticulate and deflesh naturally. Um, or perhaps artificially, we've been talking about the difference between natural and artificial mummification and what cats are having the same uh, sort of wranglings about excarnation at the minute and the, di the different forms that excarnation can take. Um, we've got cut marks and polishing on the bones here suggesting that in some instances excarnation was sped up artificially by people. Um, and you'll see the difference that people, uh, the different words that people have chosen to use. So, uh, uh, something that's very alien to people, I chose the words defleshing and disarticulation. For me, very descriptive words and quite neutral terms, something that I would use in archaeology all the time. But people reacted really negatively towards them. And you can see that cultural bag baggage coming with, with words that I thought were actually quite neutral. So defleshing and disarticulation is disturbing language, potentially, for recently bereaved um, people. And it's interesting, they didn't seem to note that some of the um, intricacies of what would be involved in mummification for, for removing the organs, for instance. Yeah, they didn't have the same reaction to people, you know, people being eviscerated in the mummification process. Um, we've, in thinking about uh, writing and rewriting the past, we've also been thinking about the, the role that the project's having on our interpretations of the past, which was kind of quite an unexpected um, impact of the project really. Uh, when I started working with my uh, uh, colleagues Laura and Christina in, in End of Life Care, I started to have, have a read through and familiarise myself with um, the literature on bereavement and grief um, and thinking about the way that grief counsellors today think about grief and mourning. And we uh, basically see a progression. There used to be the idea of a kind of staged approach to grief where you, you move through grief in, you know, you work through it in order to get over the dead. You had to become de detached to them in order to create new new attachments. Um, from about the 1990s onwards, um, people recognised that actually that's usually not re what really <coughs> happens when someone's bereaved. That the um, death of someone won't necessarily be a, be the end of that relationship or the end of that person's place in your life. It's just they take on a different place. Um, you rearrange what you do to encompass them in a, in a different way, even though they may not be, um, even though they're not actually physically present. The idea of continuing bonds between the living and the dead. And this is something we see in many times and places um, from archaeology and ethnography. And there's also a kind of recognition that actually grief isn't a linear process. And there are these fluctuations between acceptance and loss and that it's kind of wavy wavy process rather than a straightforward linear one. Um, and while thinking about this, whilst returning to, uh, to the plaster skulls which, we, which we've just heard about, um, it struck me that whether we're kind of missing something with the plastered skulls and whether the plastered skulls might be uh, an, another example of people's um, longing to, or desire to keep the dead closer for longer. Um, the idea of keeping the dead close in much the same way as we've seen through maybe not exactly the same thing going on, but that motivation um, not to let go of the dead. <coughs> we know that they were handled, uh, lots of wear and repair. These weren't kept pristine. They were um, seemed to be centred around um, households. Um, and we know that even the dead were buried beneath um, floors of houses be before that. So you've got this link between the living and the dead. And I wonder if that's just another extension. Um, you might think that sounds weird until you think about our own practices of keeping ashes on the man mantelpiece, for instance. Um, so just in terms of thinking about the, the narratives, it can um, be thinking about how the contemporary is also informing interpretations of the past and rewriting those as well. Um, the workshops have already ha also had an influence on the way I'm thinking about the stuff that I study um, in later prehistoric Britain and Europe. Um, so I've also I've already mentioned that in later prehistory in Britain and Europe, uh, there's no real uh, normative visible burial rite. We think it's excarnation. Bodies are disarticulated. It's very ephemeral. Therefore, there's no burial pits for, to put grave goods in to put all that stuff that goes with dead people. Our museum collections are full of 
the stuff of dead people. And this has been equally true of the past. Um, and it's got me thinking about some of the weird and wonderful ritual deposits, ritual with a capital R, that we see in the past and we can find to the, the ritual deposits or the structure deposits category. I don't really think about them any further than that. But as you can see, uh, we've had some really interesting, uh, very everyday conundrums come up for some of our participants. Uh, the one on the top left there about a jar of Horlicks that took on a special status, became solid and was left in a cupboard for five years before it could be thrown away because it had been given to someone by their um, by their parent before, before they died suddenly. Again, um, a pair of shoes that were completely misshapen and didn't serve any function for the the, the daughter, uh, or sorry, the granddaughter that, that, that decided to take these pair of shoes away after her granddad died. Um, completely non-functional, but again, couldn't be thrown away for, for many, many years until a certain uh, process had um, being gone through, got me thinking about all these richly killed or richly sacrificed weapons that we see deposited in strange places in the Iron Age. The stuff of dead people, presumably. Um, and even more so the site that I did for my doctoral research, uh, site of Broxmouth, Hillfort in South East Scotland, a very ordinary settlement, very ordinary roundhouses. And yet in the paving of the roundhouses, again and again and again as they were rebuilt, we got these uh, coin stones, very personal artefacts. Um, very difficult to break or lose, and yet the grinding faces of all of them had been deliberately hacked off and they'd been placed upside down in the paving uh, to render them useless. Um, so I wonder if actually what we're seeing behind uh, in some of these structured deposits, these ritual deposits, are actually some really tense moments in people's lives and some, some real conundrums in what to do with dead people's things, especially when you don't have a burial pit to put them in. And finally, Oh, almost finally. In fact, we're out of time, so I'll skip through this. We've also been thinking about the um, way that new technology is used and reused again in mediating those relationships uh, with the dead, whether it's um, photographs in Victorian times, plaster, plastic skulls, or um, the type kind of digital legacy. Um, it talked about the writing of code that goes behind uh, Facebook now and the online legacies. Um, and finally, we're looking at um, the workshops uh, inspiring new writings today. This is a poem that one of our workshop participants created after having visited the workshop, which um, we found kind of really quite, quite inspiring. And we're also asking our workshop participants to, to leave their handprints in a communal art, artwork inspired by cave paintings, which are both you know, anonymous <coughs> and collective at the same time which is the same as our workshop participants, so they get to invited to leave their mark <laughs> on the uh, communal art pieces. Um, so, so we've been thinking about writing and rewriting the body. We've skipped around quite a bit between um, present and past and past and present. We don't just want to make analogies between the past and the present, but we're just thinking about new ways of looking at the evidence that might have been inspired or triggered by some of the things we're seeing, rather than actually saying that there are necessarily the same things going on, both now and in the near the victims. Okay.